Welcome to today's seminar, everyone. It's now 11 o'clock and it's time to get started. It is my pleasure to introduce Dave Goetjes as our speaker today. He is currently a scientist three in RAL and has also been extensively involved in the NCAR water system program. He earned his PhD at the University of Arizona in hydrology and water resources and joined NCAR as an ASP postdoc shortly thereafter where he began to focus on hydrometeorological research and then development of the wharf hydro system. Dave's research por portfolio has focused on land surface process understanding through observational studies, modeling, and land data simulation. Of course, a major accomplishment over the last decade was the selection of wharf hydro by the NOAA Office of Water Prediction to be the national Water model, which is a distributed process based model selected for national hydrological prediction. Dave was successful in scaling Wharf Hydro for national implement, implementation in less than a year, a major accomplishment. And his team that he put together to do this one, the UCAR Science and Technical, Technology, Technical Achievement Award in 2017. Um, so today's talk is entitled Fusing Observations and Earth System Models to Advance Water Cycle Predictions Across Scales. In terms of questions, uh, questions will be addressed by Dave at the end of the seminar. If you're on the Zoom call, you can put your questions in the chat function on the bottom. If you're on the live webcast, you can put them into Slido, which is uh, located below the invitation to the live webcast. The chat. Uh, questions will be addressed by Dave first, and then we'll move on to the Slido questions. So without further ado, Dave, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks a lot, Roy. And thanks, everyone, for making the time today and sitting in on this talk, hopefully before we have another big event here in the Colorado Front Range with the snowstorm moving in today. As Roy mentioned, a lot of what I've been working on and our team's been working on in the last uh, decade or so has been focusing on different ways to advance water cycle predictions and doing that in a multi-scale manner. And so that's been a, a major focus of our activities. I'm gonna share a lot of the progress that we've been able to make in that regard uh, and talk about some emerging areas that we're just now getting into. Uh, but I do wanna emphasize throughout the talk, uh, the critical role that novel observations are playing in addressing a lot of the shortcomings that we've had in our models and ways to look at advancing these predictions. Okay, I uh, want to start off though by putting out a few acknowledgements. Um, as, as any sort of significant effort that Roy just mentioned uh, gets undertaken, there's often a huge team of people behind that. And I really want to uh, acknowledge the amazing team we have and the Wharf Hydro Development Team uh, enable to bring a model like this into operations and evolve it rapidly on very sort of strict timeframes, but also uh, while doing that, maintaining a really strong research uh, connection with our community and building this community through training and outreach activities. Uh, so it's been a real privilege to work with these folks and um, I hope I, I represent our teamwork quite well. Uh, there's a lot of other folks who've been involved in the research that's gonna be presented here. Uh, several folks uh, from the RAL team uh, looking at uh, our hydromet field implementations, um, a lot of other personal collaborators and folks who've supported uh, the work uh, and its evolution over many years. So I really want to acknowledge that. And lastly, uh, the internal sources of support that we've re received from the organization via the NCAR Water Systems Program, the NCAR STEP Program, and going back in time quite a ways, the Biocomplexity and Times Programs. Uh, those were all major contributors to, to what's evolved uh, into the work that we'll see today. Uh, Roy covered a good part of the, the my background here, so I'm not going to dig too deeply in that. I'll just highlight a couple of other things um, in between uh, academic stints. Uh, I worked as a consulting engineer uh, for a large engineering firm doing hydraulic routing, modeling of rivers and looking at flood processes at very fine scales, uh, doing a lot of water resources assessments and also looking at uh, agricultural engineering system design as it relates to water supply for those. 
Um, and all of those uh, backgrounds influenced uh, sort of the approach that we've been taking with, with our modeling in addition to sort of the, the basic science aspect of that. Um, the other thing is uh, I'd like to acknowledge out of this is uh, along the way, you know, we've really been able to do a lot of work in education, outreach and training, uh, both with uh, the modeling system that I'll be discussing and hydrometeorological instrumentation and doing that around the world. And that's really been a, a key avenue for us to, to reach out to community and incorporate research and build new collaborations uh, in many different locations. So with that, I'll move into the prime motivation for a lot of the work that we do. And our prime mo motivator is, is pretty straightforward. And it was actually just uh, on Monday, um, a great example, another great example of why we need to accelerate progress in water cycle predictions uh, came out. Uh, many of you I'm sure saw the, the recent paper, it's been all over the news, uh, by Park Williams and folks on uh, nature climate change on the intensity and the widespread nature of the current drought throughout the Western United States. Uh, the graphics on the right hand side are taken from that paper and show a number of different characterizations of this drought uh, in terms of its aerial extent uh, on the top panel going back a couple decades. Uh, using reconstructions to go back over almost 1500 years in total to look at the comparative magnitude of this drought compared to other droughts. And that was sort of the headline of this article. And also to look at the trend, as it, as it were, the variability that we've seen over the last century in Colorado river flows as another indicator of widespread drought in this area. So drought has certainly been an aspect of an evolving water cycle, which is of prime interest. Almost juxtaposed to that is uh, the, the idea or the, the evidence that precipitation intensity values are also changing in significant ways and leading to increased flooding uh, occurrences in different ways. And Andres Prine's work, uh, among others in this area, have really sort of documented that. And both of these uh, features of our climate system, particularly here in the Western US, is really showing us that hydrologic change is amplifying as the climate continues to warm. And of course, then the societal impacts from these extreme hydrologic events are continuing to amplify. And as we look at past records of hydrologic variability as guidance for what we might expect in the future, we find that we can't do that anymore. And a, a classic paper by Chris Milley and others in 2015 uh, looked at that and said, you know, we need to develop better prediction capabilities because our past records aren't going to offer us the predictability that we need to get there. So the question then is how do we as hydrologic or system scientists begin to provide the knowledge and prediction tools for helping society adapt and mitigate to these new risks. And this really speaks to NCAR's fundamental mission, right? So we're here, we conduct fundamental research that enables the actionable earth system science and discovery. And over the course of the talk, I want to draw that back to three main tenets of that, as they're outlined in the strategic plan, that highlights the emphasis on long-term team-oriented science and technology, the ways we maintain and develop state-of-the-art instrumentation to address shortcomings in our knowledge, the, the ways that we develop and apply community models for societal benefit, and really how do we adopt um, these co-development systems engineering approaches to implementing models in operations or in applications that, again, derive direct societal benefit. So these are some of the things I'm really hoping to, to draw out from the talk as we proceed. There are a number of different societal imperatives for advancing water cycle predictions. I mentioned a few of those. Um, the graphic on the right hand side came out of a recent National Academies assessment report that looked at uh, the associated changes or ranges in confidence in our skills uh, to predict these changes, as well as um, the understanding of various climate uh, change impacts on particular event types. And this came uh, was shared with us in the step group by a presentation of, of Glenn Ramin, among others, that have uh, drawn attention to this. And it really suggests that we've got these time and space scales from climate impacts that we are trying to deal with. There is high confidence and understanding at some of the very largest scales of the impacts from climate change. But as we get to that lower left-hand corner, there's a number of different significant events, many of which are water-related, that we have low confidence and low understanding of with respect to how climate change is really going to impact those and impact our lives. And so to address these, we need impacts relevant forecasting capabilities 
And those forecasting capabilities are going to have to handle very high spatial and temporal resolution in order for people to be able to adequately respond to those. There's also the general issue of understanding there's a finite nature of water resources, freshwater resources. Human demand is going up. There's really no argument about that, but freshwater resources are finite, uh, lacking sort of an infinite energy source to convert seawater into to drinkable water. So uh, that places a premium on our prediction skill to be able to plan for the availability of freshwater resources. And so looking at these imperatives, we really do need to make sustained progress on multi-scale prediction school, uh, tools that are rigorously validated and not only capable of producing sort of the natural systems, uh, but the anthropogenic systems and doing that at scales that are societally relevant. So what might some of the elements of that prediction capability be? Uh, in, in my view, they are flexible and extensible modeling systems uh, that are agile enough to work in a variety of different environments and a variety of different scales. Uh, they are able to rapidly incorporate critical Earth system observations uh, that close the gaps in our understanding or help keep the models faithful through data fusion and data assimilation approaches. The models must be uh, highly evolvable uh, to keep pace with the rapid progress of research and other sources of information. And that really means uh, in an operational prediction sense, being fully engaged in the research to operations and operations to research paradigm, which is something I'm gonna elaborate on. And also a uh, key part of this is being able to engage, engage an inclusive community of model users and developers. So where have we come from uh, and where are we? Right now we have uh, high resolution physics-based modeling systems that work across the country uh, at continental scales or even larger scales and are generating very high resolution, uh, both temporal and spatial uh, sources of information 24 seven, 365. This was not the case 20 years ago when a lot of the work that we're going to be talking about started. Uh, these new modeling systems, such as Wharf Hydro that I'll talk about, are providing seamless conservative water accounting from hours to decades. They are couplable to atmospheric models for looking at coupled prediction problems, as well as uncoupled hydrologic prediction applications. And uh, they are available to a global community that's working on open source codes. 20 years ago, when this work started, it was not quite that case. There was a large disconnect between the weather and climate communities and what would be, what would be defined as the traditional hydrologic forecasting and hydrologic application sector. Operational hydrology was highly place-based and uh, had a very sort of limited mode of, of forecasters working in that. And I would say from a prediction capability, the massive fraction of the landscape of say our country and the nation's waterways had no forecast guidance associated with them. So what is behind that sort of disparity? Uh, it really it comes from differing views of the world. The classical hydrologist view was much more catchment, watershed centric and object centric than what we see today. Uh, I often call these the basin blinders where a hydrologist knows in great detail what's going on in their watershed that they study or are doing predictions on. And they're interested in sort of the, the unit output from that watershed, but uh, go to a different region, go to a different uh, climate regime. Um, and that knowledge was often not very transferable in many ways. To contrast that, a weather and climate modeler's view, which is much more common here at NCAR, uh, was very rich in process representation and general process representations on the surface, but it often made some pretty significant assumptions, simplifying assumptions about the structure of the landscape and its influence on hydrology. And this kind of gives rise to sort of the flat earth perspective that dominated land surface modeling for quite a long time. In addition to that, you had vastly different utilization strategies for technology. Uh, the classical hydrologist view was, uh, was a hydrologic modeler sitting in a desk curating data sets very extensively by hand uh, in the preparation of the forecast because a lot of those details of, of local processes, local meteorology, local land cover features uh, did have a big impact on the resulting forecast. Uh, they were not using high performance computers, as you see on the right. Uh, that was the domain of weather and climate modelers, has been since the beginning of weather and climate modeling, is sort of the, the Richardsonian approach to, to environmental modeling. Um, and uh, it, these things were just uh, very different moving back in time. 
And this, these differences gave rise to many problems. It left many areas without forecast coverage. If you were forecasting at a point at a basin outline, uh, outlet, that was, that was nice, but it lacked a lot of the interior information uh, where people may live and where decisions need to be made. Uh, the older methods of forecasting depended on human bodies to create forecasts, and of course that's easily overwhelmed in very significant events, and I'll show you an example from the 2013 floods around here uh, where that was the case. Essentially, the forecast processes can't scale up, and they weren't repeatable in a situation where humans are so deeply embedded within the loop. There are major inconsistencies between land surface models and hydrologic prediction models that needed to be overcome. Models ran on different spatial frameworks. They ran at different spatial scales. They were incompatible scales or process assumptions baked into the models and disconnected workflows. That meant that we got different answers in terms of uh, say water and energy budget closures depending on these different modeling approaches. And in general, the codes between the communities were not transferable or reusable. And so more generally, the communities lacked a common language, whether it be a computer language or even a scientific language to really discuss and resolve uh, process and prediction related issues. And there's a lot of talking past each other that happened uh, back then. So we needed to do things a different way. And that's uh, sort of the situation that I uh, found when I arrived at NCAR in around 2002. And it really started us out on uh, working with other people uh, along the way on building modeling systems that represent critical processes at scales and focus on the component coupling in many ways that hadn't been done. And this is all sort of within the terrestrial and lower atmosphere part of the system. So this involved utilizing scaling analysis to separate key process representations, uh, enabling true multi-scale modeling methodologies with explicit aggregation and disaggregation, not just simplifying parameterizations, but really trying to represent processes at different scales and also a, a significant incorporation of high-performance computing. Um, this involved modularizing the code architectures to protect the fidelity of some of the source codes that were being used, but developing ways to link these codes together in, in agile ways so that the dominant behaviors of the Earth system could be expressed at different scales. And then more generally, uh, looking at ways to more radically adopt a multidisciplinary approach to encompass all of the things that really do influence and dominate hydrologic signatures on the land surface. And you can see a number of those written there. And so that brings us to our sort of conceptual framework for what became wharf hydro development in this broader area of research. We start with sort of the global hydrologic cycle and through the work in the weather and climate communities, we acknowledge a very strong but highly nonlinear and complex coupling between the water and energy cycles that are occurring at multiple time and space scales. And the models do need to be able to handle these because of the strong nonlinearities in the system. One of those driving mechanisms is the idea that the fine scale processes that occur on the land surface, water moving around, being stored in the landscape and fluxing through the landscape, is driven by fine scale processes that are often unresolved in, in traditional weather and climate models. But through the nonlinear feedbacks that we have through surface energy fluxes and boundary layer fluxes, these behaviors become important. They lead to new emergent behaviors that uh, evolve within the atmosphere. So these are the multi-scale process representations that needed to be linked together. So with that, the outline for the talk, with that motivation, the outline for the talk is essentially discussing many of the different research activities and applications that came in uh, through the development and use of the Wharf Hydro system broadly under the banner of multi-scale modeling. I'll talk a little bit about how we've been able to operationalize this for uh, a wide variety of applications and societal benefit and really uh, ways that we've utilized the research to operations and operations to research paradigm to create an evolutionary cycle for model development. We'll be addressing some of the prediction deficiencies that have emerged through the application of the model uh, and how those have been addressed through some joint model observation campaigns. This is where we've identified specific weaknesses in the model and really targeted our own observational campaigns with collaborators to go address those. And then finally, we'll wrap up with how we've diversified a lot of these research uh, applications and operations uh, to address new and emerging societal needs. Okay, 
So the backbone of a lot of the research that we're going to be talking about today comes out of the development of the Wharf Hydro model. And so the schematic on the left-hand side gives you the conceptual overview of this. We are really trying to fuse together the best of both worlds from the, uh, the detailed process representations that come from column land surface modeling, which is a strength in the weather and climate communities, with the distributed hydrologic processes that come through very high resolution, detailed understanding of how water moves through and over the landscape. And we do this again in an explicit multi-scale way. And that's been that way since the origination of Wharf Hydro back in 2002 and 2003. Uh, and it's acknowledging that there is a dynamic uh, movement of water through these landscapes, and it has every bit in controlling the spatial patterns and the time scales of water availability and water fluxes uh, through the system. And so multi-spatial framework support is a key part of the Wharf Hydra system. Over on the right-hand side, this diagram is essentially uh, an inclusive diagram of the overall Wharf Hydra ecosystem in this black box in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, highlights the physical components of the modeling system, the column land surface model, the terrain routing modules, and the channel and uh, reservoir modules, and how they're linked together through sets of multi-spatial scale, multi-scale spatial transformations. So that's the core uh, computational model component. These other components around the edge have to deal with uh, a variety of tools that help with pre and post processing and data assimilation of information coming to and from the model. And that's a, a lot of where the work has centered in the last several years is, is building out that ecosystem. Looking at a timeline of development, um, you can see that uh, early on progress uh, was incremental and slow. We had a number of different applications uh, that occurred, uh, but you know things were just really taking shape. One of the biggest applications was a forecasting application funded by the World Bank for the country of Romania. And that system is still actually in operations today, providing operational forecasting for, for the Romanian government. We were doing a lot of work around the 2011 period in the North American monsoon, uh, as that was an area of my uh, dissertation research. Since then, however, and through the engagement of a large team and community of people, both here at NCAR, throughout the US university institutions, and also throughout uh, internationally, we've seen a huge growth, sort of an explosive growth of the application and use of the model. Many of these are milestones related to the national water model development that Roy mentioned. Many of these are related to specific applications looking at land atmosphere coupling and fully coupled applications of wharf hydro with wharf uh, and looking at regional climate processes. And other of these milestones are related to how we've infused um, specific observations to address process shortcomings in the model. But as you can see, it's really been a, a very busy timeline since about 2011 with a lot of very high impact applications of the model. Uh, and those are the culmination of a lot of research that went into those. Uh, just a quick sidebar again to emphasize this would not have happened in isolation here at NCAR alone. And so this is one of the benefits of having a community modeling system. Uh, prior to about 2016, a lot of our, our training work was sort of ad hoc. Um, and we'd show up, give a two or three day model training, uh, provide code on a website and, and keep going with some limited documentation. But in about 2016, we hired uh, a training coordinator, Molly McAllister, and, and we've seen, a, again, an explosive growth in the way that we support this training uh, around the world for a number of different communities. So what are some of these key research innovations that have happened over this period of time? Uh, this study here highlights uh, work that was done in looking at the impact of this uh, enhanced hydrologic process representation on fully coupled atmosphere terrestrial hydrologic predictions. So uh, the study that we're showing here from Alfonso Senatore, a close collaborator in Italy, and a number of the different studies listed along the bottom have pointed to sort of a consistent body of work, what we get when we improve the process representation of hydrology at using these multi-scale tools. On the left-hand side, uh, what you see is an enhancement of the pattern of surface skin temperature variability, which is a signature of the thermal expression of the surface um, and relates to the surface energy fluxes at the surface. When we use the enhanced hydrologic routing capabilities designated as work hydro here, then when we don't, uh, the, you can see the shift in the distribution 
of the um, of the surface temperature uh, when we uh, apply these to get closer to the observed modus derived surface temperature dis distribution uh, compared to when we don't. Uh, this has a direct impact on the latent heat fluxes that are expressed from the land surface. There's a sort of an increased pattern of variability while the pattern signatures are somewhat similar in this case. The range and the magnitudes end up being quite a bit different. And that in turn results in different precipitation patterns. And the precipitation pattern is not monolithic. It's not monotonic. It doesn't move in just one direction. Sometimes it enhances precipitation. Sometimes it diminishes precipitation. Sometimes it moves precipitation features around. But the body of studies that we've shown uh, have, have largely resulted in modest improvements in precipitation simulation or prediction skill, and those in turn on the right, far right hand side have led to improvements in predictions of say accumulated runoff or stream flow behavior from these types of applications. And so that uh, graphic on the lower right hand side shows that if you use a, a default wharf model configuration uh, without the enhanced process representation that this particular simulation tended to overestimate precipitation. And when we improve the land surface physics, it tends to bring uh, the runoff signatures from these back in line with what the observations were saying. Beyond just sort of the local hydrologic impacts, uh, these impacts can, under certain conditions, drive differences in internal variability in the model, which can lead to things like changes in storm tracks, um, depending on the atmospheric conditions, particularly under weakly synoptically forced conditions that we see in summertime uh, situations. Uh, the study here was done by uh, Thomas Rumbler, sorry, uh, from uh, the Inst Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, which has been a long-term collaborator of ours, and looked at the difference or the impact of uh, the storm migration, the storm tracks that were occurring in these summertime stores, storms when the enhanced hydrology was operating within the modeling domain. And you can see for the weakly forced case on the left, through a number of large ensembles, they were able to look at differences in storm tracks associated with these. And really uh, what the diagram on the right hand side shows is that uh, the differences in the water budget partitioning aren't quite so great until you get around these very active storm periods. And then you can get significant differences between the models in terms of their water budget partitioning. That can include changes in precipitation, but also where the results of that precipitation in terms of runoff are going. Are they going to surface runoff or subsurface runoff production? And what's the longer term impact of those on the evapotranspiration signals? Probably the most comprehensive evaluation of this, uh, the impact of high resolution hydrology on atmospheric response to date uh, came from study of Benjamin Fersh 2019. So uh, Benjamin from the same group that we've been working with for a long time. Uh, and in Southern Germany, there was a long-term surface atmosphere integrated observing campaign that went on where they were measuring at a number of different sites, a host of hydrologic uh, variables in the land surface from groundwater levels to soil moisture to surface energy fluxes all the way through boundary layer and cloud uh, and precipitation observations. And looking at a, a long-term modeling observational study, what Benjamin found was the consistent improvement in lower atmospheric temperature and improvements in particularly more so in lower atmospheric humidity when using the enhanced hydrologic functions. And that's what the diagrams in the upper right show. Along the bottom is a set of comparisons between the models, uh, both with and without uh, the wharf hydro routing functions and flux tower estimates of sensible and latent heat fluxes uh, across a number of months, uh, looking at the diurnal cycle of these energy fluxes and also uh, from a number of um, three different sites. And invariably, what we see is, is that the, uh, the, the model runs without the enhanced hydrology tend to produce more erroneous uh, energy fluxes, whether they be excessively high sensible heat fluxes or low latent heat fluxes in this particular case, compared to uh, when the routing physics are active. And so sort of from the land surface all the way up through the lower atmosphere, uh, validated against observations, uh, we see these process enhancements having benefit. 
on our side uh, of, of the Atlantic, uh, we were doing a lot of work also in uncoupled prediction uh, applications. This has to do with uh, essentially driving the Wharf Hydra system in an offline mode by prescribed meteorology, whether that comes from NWP or radar or uh, now casting tools or longer term modeling tools. And so this work really shine, got a new light shined on it during the 2013 flood. And so we were operating really in real time at that time under the STEP program, or what was the precursor to the STEP program, generating operational hydrologic forecasts driven by numeric weather prediction models in this very high resolution capability. And as you can see from uh, the, the main animation that ran on the top and the very high resolution implementation that was done by Kevin Stampson in the lower right hand corner, uh, we're really looking at being able to capture a lot of the fine scale spatial and temporal dynamics of the flood waves that were generated during that, during that particular system. And this became very important because up until then, the National Weather Service had really just been using point-based forecasts. And you can see the green dot scattered across the front range domain there and uh, really providing limited coverage. And of course, during that event, the local weather service office got fairly overwhelmed. Uh, with information and the need for improved uh, forecast guidance. Uh, in turn, uh, the domain that we had implemented and were operating had over 200,000 different uh, locations where there was information coming in from the model on, on hydrologic uh, processes. We could zoom into those and look at the spatial and temporal dynamics of flood waves coming out of the mountains down into the plains. And then ultimately, this has more recently led to the production of downscaled flood inundation maps that have been produced uh, by our group here as well, to add further point to that. Unbeknownst to us at that time, around 2013, 2014, uh, the National Weather Service was looking at implementing a national water model, sort of a unified forecasting system that would provide coverage for the country. The goals of that were listed over there on the right, provide operational forecast guidance to underserved locations, have a 24-7, 365 capability, interface that with a variety of different geospatial tools for decision making, and also really to be able to rapidly infuse critical observations. And so what we were able to do in very short order is take the research versions of Wharf Hydra that we were using and scale it up to CONUS implementations through utilization of high performance computing, a lot of process enhancements and a lot of uh, improved data sets to generate what you end up seeing there on the right hand side, which is sort of the first very high resolution nationally integrated hydrologic forecasting system for the country. And you can see how it's responding to a variety of the different time and space scales of weather events moving across the countries, generating flood waves that are propagating down river networks and producing the cross scale information transfer that's critical uh, to hydrologic predictions. And this has been uh, a sprint ever since. Um, we have been through six years of, of model development and we're going on our sixth version of, of code here uh, that's currently active. Uh, five of those have already been put into operations. And there's a lot of process enhancements that we don't have time to go into today that have gone into every one of these versions, whether it be improvements to the meteorological data, the model parameters, the physics process representations, expanding into different domains beyond CONUS, such as Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Alaska, uh, and so on. What I will focus on though, is uh, the improvement in the model that's occurred over that period. And uh, the summary statistics that we have on this, particularly from a stream flow uh, perspective, um, tell the story of, uh, of a lot of great model development. We've more than doubled the scale of the model system operationally in five years. Um, and that has been evidenced by improvements in bias of hourly stream flow, um, hourly stream flow correlation values, and other hydrologically combinatorial metrics that we use to track performance. Uh, in addition to the improvement over CONUS that we've got over those five years, like I said, we've been able to implement some of the first ever standing forecast capabilities for places like Hawaii and Puerto Rico, which really didn't have operational forecasting in the past. Uh, this is a set of graphics that was created by Augury Duggar, one of our co-leads of the National Water Model Project. Um, and uh, here we're documenting the improvement in bias over version over version in the model. You see an improved central tendency of the histograms for each version of the model 
up on the top on the lower left-hand side, you can see the areas across the country where we have high confidence in what the model is producing and areas where there is still a lot of room for improvement. Similarly, we uh, can look at correlations or the timing of stream flow responses. On the top, you see these histograms shifting over to the right-hand side as we try to get uh, a dominance of high correlation values in the model performance. And again, uh, you see some uh, areas across the country where our model is doing quite well. And of course, this pervasive area throughout the middle of the country, which has remained challenging uh, from a model implementation perspective. And so just to give you an example of the kinds of research that goes into improving uh, the model in each one of these versions, this is just a listing of the enhancements that went into version 2.1, which is now the currently operational version of the model. Um, you see things like different model configurations, extending to different domains, uh, changes in the meteorological data, changes in the physics processes that were represented here. Every one of these lines in this um, enhancement, this uh, version enhancement, has a research story behind it in terms of being able to identify different data sources or different process representations, testing them in the model, uh, looking at the impact of calibration on the overall model performance, and, and then pushing that into operations. One research highlight I do want to mention is a very recent one, and that is how we have uh, done some work to improve the representation of agricultural systems, which is a very important uh, area or uh, you know, uh, system in our earth system models. And this uh, is really acknowledging that uh, the issue of tile drainage from ag lands is known to play a significant role, soil moisture dynamics, and therefore surface energy dynamics and runoff partitioning, but they're generally not represented in many earth system models for doing high resolution forecasts across the landscape, this becomes a very important aspect of, of agricultural hydrology. And so Prasant Valem Kunath, who's uh, been uh, implementing the work that, uh, that was spec'd out on this in terms of uh, implementing a tile drainage formulation or a series of tile drainage formulations into the Wharf Hydro code. And so we assessed a number of different methodologies for this. And the outcome of this, uh, if we look across our variety of not just water budget statistics, but event-based stream flow metrics, which are a key aspect of hydrologic forecasting, we see improvements uh, across the board in the use of the calibrated tile drainage formulation in terms of contingency statistics like hit rates for flow, uh, flow threshold exceedances, uh, reduction in false alarm rates, improvements in bias, and improvement in timing. And that is, those improvements range uh, by 20 to 50 percent in terms of improvements in model bias in some of these relevant areas. And you can see in the upper left hand corner uh, and, you know, what some of the tile dominated tile drainage dominated areas of the country. The last application of the national water model uh, that I'm going to share here is one of the most exciting things, and that is that we've been able to recently, through a project funded by NOAA, couple the national water model formulation to the emerging UFS unified forecast system capability. So this work builds on a lot of the earlier coupled wharf wharf hydro uh, studies that uh, discussed in the past and some of the generalized findings that's come from that and trying to roll that into the latest generation of the regional UFS model. And so this work is collaborative with the folks over in PSL and series uh, and our group here at NCAR. And uh, we just got the first batch of results from this new capability that uh, it came out right before uh, the, the holidays and was presented by Jason English at the AMS conference uh, showing the results. And again, these seem to be in line with prior fully coupled studies. Basically what you're looking at is temperature bias uh, aggregated over a large area. Um, and essentially there's a warm bias in the model that was existing uh, when we don't use the enhanced hydrologic process representations. And to a certain degree that's been mitigated through the incorporation of the enhanced physics. Very early results though, but um, uh, this is an exciting entree into a fully coupled operational weather prediction. So really what we've been engaging here again is this concept of a research to operations and operations to research development cycle. And it strongly engages aspects of model diagnostics and evaluation, and then the identification of key weaknesses in the modeling systems, and then also going out and creating or participating in targeted observational campaigns to address some of these process shortcomings. So we've kind of been looking at the lower part of this cycle and the, the uh, 
the first half of this presentation. Now I'm going to spin up and go to the upper right hand side and talk about some of the coordinated field research campaigns that have complemented the model development. Uh, serendipitously, this is uh, this sort of uh, approach is very consistent with our recent OSTP report, which identified a national roadmap for areas of opportunity to improve our system predictions. And of course, if you are familiar with this report, you go dig into it, you'll find three of these main uh, areas strongly linked to observational capacity improving the observations themselves, making them more targeted, and then also improving ways to get these observations into our models through a variety of different methods, data simulation, AI, ML, uh, enhanced model optimization, uh, improved process representation, so on and so forth. And again, this was a, a, a report that Glenn had shared with the STEP group uh, during a briefing a couple of weeks ago. So what have we been doing in these areas? There's quite a bit of work that had gone on uh, a, a bit further back uh, related to North American monsoon research. I'm not going to go into that during this call. It's been discussed in a few other presentations. So I'm going to discuss some of the more recent applications in this area. Those include uh, the Relampago field campaign uh, that was recently conducted in 2018 and 2019. Uh, they included the OTREC field campaign, which was done also in 2019 in Costa Rica. And then a lot of work, a lot closer to home here, looking at Colorado seasonal water supply and snowpack forecasting and a lot of the observational and modeling enhancements that we've participated in as, as that has worked. And what you see there is, a, is an eddy covariance tower that we've operated in a flux in a, uh, in a riparian area uh, near Crested Butte, Colorado, as part of a large integrated DOE study looking at uh, water and biogeochemistry processes in high mountain watersheds. So starting with Relampago, so uh, many of you may be familiar with the Relampago campaign. It occurred uh, again in 2018 and early 2019 in central Argentina and studied some of the deepest convection in the world. Uh, what may be a little less known to folks is that there was a significant hydrologic research component associated with this project. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Francina Dominguez on a, on a nice multi-scale uh, field observing and modeling study uh, in this particular region, and that work is still ongoing to this day. Um, our observational participation included a number of different hydrometeorological stations that were deployed alongside a network of EOL flux monitoring stations. Uh, we performed flood chasing with local hydrologists in Argentina and also looked at different ways to do gauge correction or at least evaluation of a number of different QPE products. And you can see some of the instrument assets shown there on the bottom. The major outcome of this work to date uh, and again, it's still unfolding uh, as we speak, is looking at uh, and assess or concluding that there's a lot of value into the surface network enhancements that were made uh, to help identify which of the remotely sensed and America weather prediction models were producing the most accurate precipitation forcings that can be used in hydrologic models. And so Sujan Pal, one of Francina's uh, PhD students, um, led a wharf hydro prediction study in this regard and was able to ingest and assess a number of different remotely sensed precipitation products and NWP products and run it through the variety of the observations and compare it against the observations that were made during the campaign. And essentially the conclusion that comes out of this is that a properly calibrated wharf hydro instance, which is needs good observations associated with it, is able to produce uh, skillful stream flow responses from these deep convective thunderstorms, provided they're fed with highly accurate precipitation forcing information, and that the surface observations are very key in constraining a lot of those remotely sensed precipitation observations. Moving back closer to home uh, and focusing again on this uh, uh, area of the East River, uh, which is an integrated water study for, supported by DOE and now NOAA. Um, we are uh, focused on trying to address a long time, long standing shortcoming in both weather climate models and hydrologic models, which is understand or acknowledging the fact that our evapotranspiration estimates, particularly in these complex terrain regions of the Western US are really poorly constrained. We do have some direct quantitative information from eddy covariance towers, but they're largely located in upland systems and in coniferous forests. And what our approach here was to try to get 
uh, end member assessment of evapotranspiration from a, a very sort of wet riparian area as an upper bound reference on evapotranspiration fluxes from one of these high mountain ecosystems. And so this work became the doctoral dissertation of Anna Riken uh, from the Colorado School of Mines uh, and Reed Maxwell uh, and myself. And essentially what we did is we deployed uh, the eddy covariant system there. It's been operating there for about five years now and has provided information on riparian uh, evapotranspiration. And what we see is, of course, that riparian evapotranspiration exceeds those of the regional upland conifer coniferous forest. There's strong seasonality associated with that and the snowpack processes which dominate uh, the high mountain watersheds. And we can see signatures of uh, the variability in seasonal snowpack timing and, and amount. But really the other critical piece of this was trying to identify from an evapotranspiration perspective, what fraction of the ET is actually subsidized by sur surface and subsurface water dynamics that are supplying the site with water, which you wouldn't get in a system that was essentially flat or didn't have the ability to, uh, to supply water to it besides sort of just the, the typical 1D version. And what that study found was that, you know, depending on the year, uh, you could get upwards of 80% or more of the evapotranspiration flux, which is actually subsidized by subsurface water movement. And this, this feeds into the entire idea of how we create hot spots for uh, water vapor transfers, exchanges to and from the atmosphere, and what drives the, the suitability of different habitats for different plant species and things like that, and why we need to be able to resolve these in our models. The work at DOE itself was actually leveraged off of a longer term prediction uh, set of work that we've been doing with the state of Colorado uh, going back to 2009. So it's been recognized that the current National Weather Service seasonal water supply forecasts uh, just haven't been providing the desired skill for water managers uh, to to manage ever tightening water resources. And there has to be a way to go explore uh, the opportunity that are presented by emerging observation systems to improve upon those. So the Colorado Water Conservation Board has been funding us since 2009 to look at a number of different methods to do this. This, in, this includes uh, studies that have involved gap filling radars, uh, in situ surface instrumentation. You can see another picture of the Eddy Covariance Tower there on the right hand, uh, in the lower right hand side. Um, and, and how it is providing information and constraint on that as well. And really, so I wanna cover the milestones on this fairly rapidly. So again, since uh, 2009, we've been doing radar in the mountain, gap filling, gap filling radar in the mountain experiments. And what those have shown is that uh, these improved depictions of precipitation can have a direct and beneficial impact on forecast skill. In addition to that was the, the funding of a study which looked at the impact of assimilating high resolution snowpack observations from airborne LIDAR systems. So this is from the Airborne Snow Observatory Group uh, into uh, this regional instance of Wharf Hydro, which is optimized for seasonal water supply prediction. And we've done this in a sort of ad hoc research manner since about 2015, 2016, and then last year, the 2020, 2021 water year. It was the first year we went full operational in terms of real-time forecasting with assimilation of ASO data into it. And what this showed was the following. Uh, essentially what we were getting is that the assimilation of the LIDAR observed snowpack conditions into the model we're providing significant correction to the open loop model forecast where we were just basically driving the model with observed meteorology and uh, letting that run in an ensemble sense throughout the rest of the year. And as you work your way through the statistics here, um, you can see the graphics on the left show the change in the forecast uh, from the open loop to the assimilated forecast. In this case, it was actually a reduction in flow that was provided by that. If we look at the final uh, verification of the year uh, and use that May 18th forecast in the middle on the left-hand side, we see that the assimilation of the ASO data that was collected in mid-May resulted in about a 25% improvement in the overall forecast. It certainly didn't create a perfect forecast, but it brought things much closer to in line with what would have been observed. 
And so if you chase the numbers down with this kind of forecast improvement, what you find, this ends up translating, if you assume an open value, open market value of water, about $350 an acre foot, which is a very conservative estimate, by the way, this translated into about $7.3 million in the market value of water, just through the improvement of, of the model. That's, that's a benefit from that. And so we've presented these kinds of impact, data impact studies to uh, various uh, sort of organizations like the Western States Water Council and the Western Council of Governments to show them what it takes to, what is, what is the value or the benefit from investments in research and improving observational capabilities. And so this little example that we've run through here just sort of illustrates that. Um, you know, essentially, if you're getting a benefit on the order of 7.35 million in terms of the, the improvement in the forecast, and you can throw in a number of different observational assets that could include uh, five in situ stations, a gap filling radar, uh, an airborne snow observatory mission, and doing the modeling itself. Uh, that runs out to about 100 or 1.2 million in costs, uh, 1.05 of which is a one-time cost, you can end up with about $6 million of benefit in a year if you assume those values of water. Clearly, there's a lot of other issues in terms of how you derive value from forecasts. But what this illustrates then is that the value of the research investments in terms of improving forecasts can be very significant when assessed against an open market value of water. Getting back into uh, some of the more process science uh, enhancements, we've been working uh, again in this high, these high mountain watersheds to look at behavior of some of the key features of snowpack. Uh, this is uh, work now that uh, we did observationally and, and Ronnie Abalafia Rosenzweig is writing up uh, that looks at how we've been improving the representation or the optimization of albedo parameters in Wharf Hydro NOAA MP, uh, particularly related to albedo decay and how that has an important role on the timing and magnitude of runoff generated from melting snowpack. And the graphics in the lower right-hand side show what we get when we optimize these parameters. And also when we transfer these uh, parameters to other sites and seeing how far an optimized set of parameters are relevant for improved model performance. The last enhancement that I'll talk about is, is a fun one. Um, this came out of research that we did uh, in Norway originally, looking at improving the representation of alpine glaciers, because they are a very key aspect of many uh, hydrologic systems, uh, speaking to the water towers of the world, and are obviously very vulnerable under a warming climate scenario. So uh, true to Eidhammer has been uh, sort of the, one of the lead developers of this activity and in, in implementing a Alpine glacier formulation into Wharf Hydro and looking at the impacts of that on our runoff. And just in December, we were able to transfer this capability into an operational forecasting capability for a hydropower company in Iceland. So again, deriving direct benefit from uh, collaborative research in, in Earth system modeling. Uh, to a group in Iceland, which is responsible for providing uh, energy for the, for the entire uh, island. Um, if the talk of cold season processes has you nostalgic for Game of Thrones um, and, and the frozen north, yes, Iceland is where they uh, did a lot of the filming for, for the series, looking at things going on north of the wall. So uh, that's actually from the similar area which we were working at with this implementation. Okay, so starting to wrap up here. The hydroscape today in our environmental prediction systems has really evolved a lot. So circa 2022, uh, the Wharf Hydro instance of the national water model has now been operating for five years uh, over the country. It has more than doubled its scale since the implementation. And we continue to scale out to new domains and new hydro regimes, glaciers, wadi systems, tropical islands, so on and so forth. There's really an evolution of environmental prediction that's going on in this regard, and it speaks to this idea of a total water forecast. And uh, just last week as well, we were notified by the National Ocean Service that we'll be working with them and on implementation for a fully coupled coastal flood inundation system for the island of Timor uh, through funding from the Department of State. We also have collaborations with the USGS uh, in looking at uh, coupled uh, coastal and inland water prediction. So we've seen a massive integration between the science and the practice disciplines uh, that, I, that I pointed out at the beginning of the talk where there was a schism. 
We've also seen a massive democratization of the codes and the compute capabilities. These things are accessible to people all over the world now. And the cloud, uh, we've uh, fully embraced cloud applications for training and use of the model. We've ported the model to the cloud. It's being used in a variety of different contexts that ways. And it's really improving accessibility. In my view, the new limiting factor that is sort of impeding uh, our improvements in skill have to deal with data. And so that is, sorry, my screen here is trying to move something so I can read this. And that will be access to data, the quality of the data, the volume of the data, and really what we do with the data. So that brings me to where we're headed, uh, sort of the view through the windshield. And in my view, our imperative is a need to accelerate coupled land hydro data simulation and observational capabilities. This is truly a multi-scale and multidisciplinary challenge. It's essential to improving predictions and it requires in-depth knowledge of both the models and the observations. And clearly NCAR is a natural leader in this arena and there are massive opportunities for engaging in this. We have a host of different projects spinning up within sort of the Wharf Hydro team along these lines already. Um, I'm gonna talk in a minute about the USGS water census. There are other global forecasting applications uh, so we've got uh, work going on that is oriented towards a global UFS implementation, as well as uh, already funded project looking at UFS and JEDI that speaks to, to this uh, observational model, model fusion. Um, we also just last week were, as I mentioned at the top of the talk, were awarded a project to uh, work with NASA and uh, the Drought Center in Nebraska to um, uh, contribute to the North American Drought Monitor. And then I already mentioned the National Ocean Service Project. So the USGS has been uh, working with us uh, in the Research Applications Lab in a project led by Tim Schneider uh, on a variety of different fronts. One of these is making contributions of the sort of new generation of Earth system models to their national water census. And what the water census is, is their sort of periodic uh, status update of what the water availability and demand for the country is. And historically, this has been somewhat of a fractured effort that's occurred in different areas across the country. So the USGS has come to us to look at ways to unify this type of activity, uh, utilizing basically state-of-the-art uh, modeling and observational, observationally assimilating capabilities that we've demonstrated. And so this will be linking to their national water observing infrastructure and uh, you know, future uh, avenues on coupled uh, climate and water prediction to look at uh, future scenarios for the water census. The drought monitor project, similarly speaking, is looking at taking a research, what was a research instance of Wharf Hydro coupled to the NASA land information system, which is a land data simulation system, and then developing a number of different scenarios and downscaling methods using Wharf Hydro to come up with more spatially specific or accurate information related to drought severity and drought impacts and feeding those products into the National Drought Monitor. And so this work, again, is uh, we was just awarded last week and we are extremely excited to be, again, translating our research into another operational instance um, that will be providing critical information uh, for the country. And with that, um, that is the end of the talk and uh, hopefully have conveyed a, a breadth of the research that's been going on. I certainly wanna re-acknowledge the team of people uh, that have been involved in this. Um, and I I've, I've hope I've represented our work well and where we're going, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. I, I know this is virtual and we can't quite uh, get you the same applause, but I'll, if for those of you who are virtual, please put your applause button up on the reactions. Uh, I don't see any questions under the chat at the moment. So if you have some questions, please put them in. Oh, I just see one just appeared from Jared Lee. Uh, the question is, what are the primary forecast challenges that you see that contribute to why Wharf Hydro National Water Model isn't doing as well in the US Plains? Also, a screen great... for... yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, it's a great question. It's been the subject of a lot of different um, investigation, not just by our group, but but many others. 
Um, in my view, there are a couple of dominant things that are occurring in that area. I think we have, uh, on one hand, a, a set of observational deficiencies that are contributing to that. While we have a good radar network in the area, there are deficiencies in understanding some of the cold season processes where precipitation is falling and um, not necessarily contributing to runoff in the area. That's one. The other one is there's an enormous amount of management of the hydrologic systems in those areas. Um, they could, they're not all large scale. Many of these are small scale feed, field scale things such as uh, the tilling activities, the terracing activities, the impoundments uh, of, of farm ponds and things like that, which significantly disrupt the flow of water uh, across the landscape and also promote infiltration in the area. Related to that is the strong connection between surface water and groundwater in the area and the impacts of groundwater pumping that are uh, directly impacting say water table surfaces and the potential for runoff production in these areas. So I can't say we can point to one single aspect at this point in time, but there's a multitude of things here which our models really aren't handling. They do tend to be sort of small scale features but in the aggregate can have a large impact on our hydrologic predictability. And we're pursuing a lot of these things, as I mentioned, through things like tile drainage, uh, improved surface water, groundwater coupling, uh, and things like that. So uh, uh, Jason has a follow-up question which, which relates to this. He says the stream flow gauges aren't distributed equally across the country. To what extent is the relative dearth of USGS gauges in the plains contributing to this problem. Yeah, that, that adds a challenge, sure, where you don't have as much information. Um, the reason there aren't gauges out there are largely because there are actually not a lot of continuous water courses in those areas. So many of the traditional stream flow measurement methods that have been used by the USGS just don't work well in either ephemeral or intermittent river flow systems. And there's an, oper there's an observational enhancement opportunity there uh, for one thing. Uh, but it me also means that we have uh, a lack of data from some of those systems uh, to, to really be able to base improvements on in, the mo in, in our models. So it's a good point. Um, I think there are opportunities to improve that, though. Okay, thank you, Dave. And it uh, looks like Tim has his hand up. You, you want to just blurt out your question? Yeah, I... <laughs> I always have, Sorry, I always have questions. I always have questions, as you know, Ray. Dave, Dave, that was a great talk. Thank you. And I'm I'm always amazed at, at the that body of work you just presented. It's it's impressive. I think one aspect of your that body of work you just shared that is often underappreciated in the community is the challenge of of transitioning research into operations and you've clearly, uh, and, and the team has clearly had a lot of success there. And having been on the receiving end of some of that at one point in my life, um, you know, I, maybe you could just, it's an open-ended question, so choose some aspect of it to respond to, but maybe you could touch on some of the challenges of, you know, when there are operational constraints and you're trying to implement the best solution you know, maybe you could speak a little bit to that because I, I think it's just such an important thing and, and it's often not appreciated. Yeah, um, certainly that could be a, a really long discussion. And I think a lot of folks struggle with that, particularly here in the US, as we try and chase prediction skill, right? In our, in our models, say, compared to what ECMWF does. I would say this, you know, every operational environment has its own constraints. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we've faced, you know, in addition to just sort of a very rapid pace of development, which um, can inhibit sort of idea exploration and hypothesis testing, is when you go into specific operational environments, there just are things that you can't do, which scientifically you would want to do. That may have to deal with something as technical as code libraries, um, and parallelization structures of models, which may not seem very scientific, but they can have a big impact on the, the timeliness, latency, and sometimes accuracy of forecasts. Uh, but often, particularly to this latter point that I made of fusing observations and models together, one of the biggest constraints we're going to have in really accelerating progress in that area operationally is making sure all those observations are adequately quality controlled and put into 
a, an accessible format and timeliness state so that they can be assimilated into models. I think from satellites, that issue has largely been addressed and is fairly straightforward, but from a heterogeneous observational network where we've got observations coming in in a variety of different formats, different variables, different sources, this is gonna be a really key challenge in being able to advance prediction skill uh, until we get uh, essentially better data governance policies and able to and that are able to handle that. Okay, thank you, Dave and Tim. Thank you for the great question and the great response, Dave. Um, Bill makes a comment to um, that uh, we should wrap this up in five minutes, and I agree. Uh, are there any Slido questions? Uh, Brett or Jenny, I can't see this. No, slide. there are no, there's no Slido questions, Roy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jenny. So uh, I think we should thank Dave again for an uh, outstanding talk. And uh, yeah, you can put up your virtual clap hands. And, uh, and thank you all for, for attending and have a good rest of your day. Thank you right. very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.